We still know very little about uh, algorithmic behavior. The study of machine behavior, the algorithmic auditing, are still in the baby shoes. And we, we have to study that. And usually with the new technologies, there's some harm. I mean, there are benefits to it, but there's, there's also harm. So currently, during these, these current years, there is a lot of even scandals, lawsuits, and other things going on that also have reached the public media and have occupied and are occupying the courts of seeing what are the downsides, what's going on with these algorithms and with this algorithmic behavior. And we, the scientists, we don't also don't really understand these complex social algorithms. That's a merger of social behavior that gets algorithmified together with the algorithmic behavior. So let's let's look a little bit at some of the evidence of what we know. Well, first of all, the notion of social algorithms that you have the social dynamic and the algorithms is that it's not all algorithms. So usually when you hear the stories that somebody goes on social media and gets straight down the rabbit hole, it's kind of like deterministic. These are kind of like extremist maker machines. That's not, it's not, it's not true. And what I will work up to is a model that in communication and the field of communication is very well known for many years and many decades. And that is, that is differential susceptibility. So long story short, spoiler alert, we know for a long time that different people differentially susceptible to, to media harms in general. We, we know that way before social media, Tom and Jerry, we know for a long time, Tom and Jerry, that's probably the 1940s. And the question was always, does TV content make children violent? And the verdict has been clear for the last hundred years. No, Tom and Jerry does not make all children aggressive and violent. It's a pretty aggressive story. I mean, you have this cat beating, we have this mouse beating up the cat and it's like, it's, sometimes it's getting, it's getting pretty aggressive in there. But you know, for other children, it's very uplifting. So this, you know, because children are usually small and there's a small mouse, you know, standing up to the big cat, it's actually a positive thing. So no, so there's differential susceptibility of media effects. That's what we work up to in this talk. So, but let's look at it first of all. So the story that it's just like deterministic machine. No, it's not. And it's also because the effect is not a hundred percent. So you see here, for example, that's a study from Google's YouTube. And you can see that recommender algorithms explain about half of the story. So people about 10% get the content on YouTube from the homepage, and then the YouTube video uh, is about another about 30, 40%, 40%, let's say, so 50% gets from there. Then a lot of other content comes from proactive searches from people, which is also probably then algorithms. So we could say it's 50, maybe 60% or from external URLs. Or well, maybe they also come from another recommender algorithm if you tweet it, that's, well, we can argue about that, but basically the truth is people are also involved in, in this. And then if you look at the machines of these algorithmic audits, like how much harms actually these algorithms do, it's true, very certain that the effect is very minor. This is a, a very cool study that's been done about echo chamber and the rabbit holes and the algorithmic biases. And you can see over time, I mean, there's certainly a shift that happens, but even the extreme conservatives, the content that they see, and the extreme liberals, the content that they see. I mean, yeah, there's a curve, but it, it looks like kind of similar. Sometimes when you open the news, it seems like, whoa, we live in completely different realities. I mean, yes, the liberals see a little bit of different reality than the, than the con extreme conservatives, but it's a question of, of degree. Now, while the effect of these algorithmic harms might might be small. The main argument is that just the platform, the numbers are so big. It's just like so many people using that so that even a small percentage has a big effect. And that's important to understand in the risk. So let's take conspiracy theories. We haven't even talked about conspiracy theories today, right? The earth is flat and um, COVID invented 5G or was it the other way around or whatever conspiracy theory. So Google's YouTube been accused of, uh, of promoting, this, the recommender algorithms of YouTube have been accused of promoting conspiracy theories and misinformation. And the algorithm, you know, it's blind tinkering. So that's what it's been doing. And it started to understand that it can predict people's behavior better and they pay more attention to if there might be some misinformation. It doesn't even care if it's misinformation or not. And then in 2019, it really ramped it down. So before, this is sort of a locked out account. So it's not even a personalized account. So before it was, let's say, between um, six and 
and, and 9% misinformation, and then they brought it down, let's just say 5% into 2019. What effect is that? So if we say the average YouTube user, you and me included, watches about 40 minutes of YouTube uh, per day. Oh, that was in this day where these statistics are from. And let's say 50% to make it easy. We're very conservative here. We're not accused of very conservative. 50% of the stats I showed you before, 50% come from a recommend algorithm. That means the average YouTube user spends 20 minutes a day consuming things that are dictated by an artificial intelligence. And now let's say 5% of that is conspiracy theory that comes down to one minute a day. Small but that's 25% of the global population. You know, it's 2 billion people. I mean, there's 1.8 billion Muslims in the world and 2.2 billion Christians and 2 billion, kind of like the same ballpark amount of YouTube users. Now, I don't know if the average Christian spends a minute a day of you know, contemplating the, the, the faith, but I know that the same amount of people consumes completely outrageous conspiracy theories uh, about that whatever happened because of an artificial intelligence that just went unchecked for a long time. So that is at the level of a religion of a, you know, the, that, that effect. And so even so the effect itself is very small, about 5%, things always go a little bit astray. And, and that also, you can see that a lot. That's a common theme that you see in the possible risks involved in the technology. One very polemic gate, uh, polemic case is the so-called Elsa gate. So Elsa gate, now basically child, child cartoon movies or, or, or snippets that actually start very, very harmless. And you see Elsa or, or Daniel Tiger or whoever you see there, the Smurfs. And then suddenly a few minutes in something really outrageous happens. Violence happens or, or sexual things happen, like stuff for adults. And it might be hilarious for adults if they finally see these cartoon characters do something, but it's difficult also for you know, algorithms to see because this content actually seems like it's done for kids. It's a cartoon. It's about Elsa from Frozen from Disney. So how pervasive is, is, is that effect? You can see that actually the Elsa gate related content, we can see it's about 1%. Now, 1%, again, that's not, that's not a lot, but there are over 35 million weekly viewers on YouTube kids in 80 different countries. So 35 million by 1%, well, that's 350,000. That's a lot of kids. Now, the biggest soccer stadium I know is in Barcelona, is like 100 and something thousand, 100,000. If you, you would fill up more than three of these soccer stadiums with children and having them watch completely inappropriate content. And that happens without anybody trying to do any harm. It's just like a parent having to go to a doctor's appointment and having a phone and giving it in the kid's hand. And it certainly looks like a Daniel Tiger show, or whatever it is, the Smurfs. And then three minutes in, something completely uh, inappropriate happens. And, and we show that to three soccer stadiums full of children every week. Now, what is the effect of the algorithm? Well, the effect of the algorithm, once you go 10 videos, you just follow the breadcrumbs, you follow the algorithm, then it's the autoplay and it plays next and next. I mean, the doctor's appointment can take a little bit longer. So there's the child out there still consuming YouTube kids child videos, and it increases up to 3.5%. Now from 1% to 3.5%. So it's more than 3.5 the amount. So what the algorithm adds onto that is that amount of children. So we fill up soccer stadiums with children every week and we have them watch things to, to that amount to see it was done by the recommend algorithm, right? So that's the probability of you just follow the recommendations of the algorithm. So that's just, that's just a lot. And so it's, the effects are sometimes very little or often very little, but it goes on a huge, on a huge scale. So that's one of the, one of the discussions that we're having. Now, it is also truth very certain that this is complementary to the harm that people do to themselves. So if people search, it's true, it's actually the person. You could Google Elsa Gate or you could look it up and then you can, you can find, so you, like you yourself can look for harmful content. You can look for content that does harm to yourself or you get it from a friend. So friends do it among themselves and you put your friends in harm, they put you into harm. And we've always been doing that. 
And there's, uh, there have been important studies about that. This study has been done by Facebook itself, by researchers from Facebook, that also shows that, for example, the polarization issue that recommended ions have been accused to is just additionally to the natural human tendency of homophily. Homophily is birds of a feather flock together. So we like confirmation bias. Remember, we like to hook up with like-minded people. It's just what we do. You go into a place, you, you go to like-minded people and you like to confirm with that. That's why you join the political party and hang out with them. So we, birds of a feather flock together. I think that's from the 1600s or something, if not earlier. So we always like to do that. And so what Facebook showed is that the effect of the, uh, the recommender algorithms to create these filter bubbles, echo chambers, these are technical terms of the filter bubbles and echo chambers that create this polarization that you know, the political left is in one bubble in the internet and the political right in another one that the algorithms are accused to fostering. That's just an additional effect to, to the human natural tendency. And they showed actually in this paper that the effect is, is actually not as large as the human effect. So the human filter out content, we say like, oh no, that's like, that's from the other side of the political spectrum. I don't pay attention to that. So the human filters out between six and 17% and the algorithm actually figure, uh, filters out much less. That's also actually good news. So artificial intelligence can help us to evolve to become less biased. So if your personal biological brain bias is at the order of whatever, up to 17%, if you would trust artificial intelligence, and ask artificial intelligence, what news should I consume? Your bias would be less. So we could lessen harms that we do to ourselves. And that is good news. It's great news. We can program algorithms, and I said that in a previous lectures, that actually do not discriminate against gender or race or something else. Humans, it's you can train judges to become Supreme Court judges, and, but this information processor will always be biased. So this is also great news that actually you can do that. Now, the problem is if it goes unchecked, these two effects add to each other. So we have the human bias, which is pretty severe, and then we have the algorithmic bias on top. And then of course, who we blame is the machine. It's kind of like, I make accidents in driving a car, but if my cruise control makes an accident, whoa, so that's the first argument that we have there, like, I, I, I mean, I, I now trust the machine. Even if it's less than a human, people still make a big deal of when the machine fails. So even so, the effect is less. And second of all, it's complementary. It's kind of like saying, look, we have been eating eggs and meat since the Stone Ages. So we always had cholesterol issues. So what's the problem with just putting some donuts on top and all the sugar and ice cream and all the other stuff, the fried food that we've been eating in the last, let's say, 50 years? What does that have to do with the, with the cholesterol pandemic that we are having all over the globe? Well, it's just like it's on top, right? It's the straw that breaks the camel's back. So it might be too much. And but as well, it might be too much only for some of us. And that brings me to something very important that is very much ingrained in the discipline. I'm here in the discipline of communication, media studies, and that's the differential susceptibility to media effects model. A long name, and there have been different versions of it. And I show you one version here from the Journal of Communication, published uh, you know not 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 so long ago, and here in the 2000s. But th there's been versions, as I said, since the 1940s, since Tom and Jerry, about that, that we know very well that media effects are not blanket uniform on everybody. They are susceptible to, to who you are and where you come from, and that has some, some differential logic. So that's what this model says. I'm going to walk you through it step by step. First, you are somebody. So you have different susceptibility of who you are. Dispositional, developmental. You might be young, you might be old, you might be more mature, you might be more mature in some things and less mature in other things. So that depends on who you are and that makes you susceptible. Some people like it really crazy about soccer. <laughs> I don't know, but you know, you have different maturities in different fields and in others you don't. Or social dispositions you also have. So that's the first proposition. We, we are all different. And then second, that there are three media responses. Then you have the media use, and that leads to a response. And the response can be cognitive, emotional, or excitative. So you can get excited. And that then eventually has the media effect. Now, what the model says is that actually 
who you are, your disposition, has an effect on, on the response in two ways. First, they act as predictors. So who you are affects what media you will use. So if you're a child, you're more drawn to you know, cartoon images. When you really like them, you don't really want to watch that stuff with the real people. And as older you get, you find yourself watching lectures online. <laughs> Who would have thought, you know? So, uh, yeah, so who you are and where you are developmental in that stage, but also dispositional and social, affects what media you choose. And then also it has a moderation effect. It has a moderator effect. The media you pursue, who you are, affects the response that you get from, right? So two people can watch the same, you know, the same media content, but get completely different things out of it. One might say like, whoa, that's very upsetting. And the other person might say, well, that's really uplifting because they compare you with somebody. Somebody might say that's an inspiration and the other person gets envious. So who you are also affects then what response states you have. In this case, an emotional response states could be a cognitive response state or an excited response states. And then that leads to the media effect. Now the media effect has a feedback loop that affects all of these previous things. And so once you use the media, that media then will also influence who you are or who you become. Now, if you watch documentaries for a year or if you watch, you know, violent cartoon superheroes for a year, that might have effect. It might also have an effect on what media that has an effect on who you become down here it might affect what media you use, you use next. And actually the media, uh, the recommender algorithm is the incarnation of that, right? The, autoplay next. And it has an effect on your cognitive emotional response. So if you only watch dramas, your emotional response, if you only talk, watch documentaries, your cognitive response might be more stimulated. So these are the four different propositions. It's not one, it's not a silver bullet. This happens and this will be the effect for people. Tom and Jerry makes children aggressive. No, absolutely not. But it's also not a hundred different effects. It's like, okay, we have four. And that's a very old model. So we know that for a long time. Let me walk you through one application to make it a little bit more clear. So let's imagine there are people with social anxiety. Now, people with social anxiety are more prone to go to online dating. Guess why? Because for them, it's really uncomfortable to be in a bar and to get to know other people or in another not just social setting. So they are more prone to go to online dating. Great. Now, this is also a moderative effect because another characteristics of who you are might be you might be very lonely. So then the online dating has a moderation effect with your loneliness, loneliness as to like, who you are, maybe an introvert, and that then leads to your response. And the response in that case, in that study, they found well, it's compulsive use. So it's a pretty toxic cocktail. Social anxiety, online dating, and then combined with the loneliness, the loneliness moderates that effect, which then leads to the media effect, the final effect. Now, what's the final effect of compulsive, addictive, use. That's well, probably negative effects on your schoolwork, on your social environment, on your professional work, on your performance. I mean, if you're addicted to something, in that case, it might be online dating, things in the rest of your life might do not go so well. So now, what do you think happens when things in the rest of your life don't go so well? Well, it will have a feedback loop back to but guess what? First of all, to your social anxiety. Because <laughs> if you go to your workplace and things don't go so well, guess how your social anxiety and how your loneliness will be developed? Well, it becomes a vicious circle, right? It also has then an effect on your uh, media interaction and of your compulsive use. You might use it more and more and more. So this is an example of this differential susceptibility to media effects. So, and that is very important. And that is something that Probably the digital paradigm and social media has underestimated, but that in the communication literature is, is very clear and has been very clear for, as I said, almost 100 years that we are not all equally susceptible. And that's also in general why, going back to the slide how we started this lecture with, why people disagree. Is technology good or bad? Well, it's how we make it, but also it's not good or bad for all of us. And that's why also it makes completely sense that one in five teens say Instagram makes them feel worse about themselves, while Facebook is very right, Meta is very right. They're going to say like, well, actually, you know, 30 to 40% say it makes them feel better or somewhat better about themselves or much better about themselves. While for the vast majority, absolutely no effect. The vast majority can watch Tom and Jerry and that's just it. They just watch Tom and Jerry. They don't feel better about themselves. Some do, it's uplifting, small children. Yeah. And 
some get aggressive, but there's a differential media effect that is very well known in media studies and cannot be underestimated. And that has also, all of that has to be calculated into the risk and the utility, making you feel better about yourself, of media use. And honestly, it's also nothing new.